Hi, welcome to the signal pad. In the episode, we're going to try another repair. This is an Azure 81101A, which is actually, even though it says an HP, really HP also transitioned this into Azure, and I don't think anything changed. This is a 50 megahertz pulse generator. Now, there's a, a variety of models of these instruments. I actually have one in the lab, I'll show you, and they can even generate patterns. And they're quite sophisticated in how you can define these pulse characteristics, and you can change almost anything about them. And I believe in some of the models, you can even measure output current, so you can have the output disconnect if it goes above a certain amount of current. So they're pretty sophisticated though, somewhat esoteric, and they're not often found in every place. But nonetheless, definitely worth fixing so we can see what's wrong with it. So let's go ahead and turn it on. Now I do know that it does turn on, and as you can see the VFD boots up. Now one of the nice things to see here is that this VFD is nice and bright, doesn't seem to have any burn-ins in it, and this is one of the things that essentially fails in these things, although it looks like all the software just passed. And once this VFD fails, it's very hard to use it, becomes very dim, and replacements are almost impossible to find. This is a dot matrix VFD display, as you can see. Now, from whatever it was said before, uh, you can see that there's some pulse definitions here, frequency 10 kilohertz. The output is off right now. It seems to be an amplitude of 2.5 volt <coughs> offset of 1.25, and it's 50 ohm into 100 kilo ohm. So you can see you can essentially change everything about it. If I go under the output, that's what the output is going to look like. And we can manipulate this. It does have a reasonably interesting menu. So this is the parameter that you can change. You can change this with this knob. So as you move around, whatever you select it, you can modify it. It's actually quite intuitive, uh, the way they have thought about this. And it uh, seems the output is on. You can turn it on and off. And the light does turn on here, which is a good sign. So let's go ahead and hook it up to something, see if we get our waveform out. I guess we're expecting to see something like this, a square wave. Okay, let's give it a try. Now here's another model of the same series of instrument. This is the 81110A. This is a 330 megahertz version with pulse and pattern built into it. And as you can see, this one actually has two outputs and both of them are differential. So there's a lot more you can do with this particular one. So let's take a look at the output of our pulse generator here on the Rodenshorst MXO4 series. This is a 12-bit converter oscilloscope with 1.5 gigahertz of bandwidth. It's insanely fast and has a huge dynamic range. We'll do a proper teardown and review of this in a future video. But for now, let's take a look and see what's coming out of our pulse generator. So I have the output of the pulse generator directly connected to channel 1, and we're in a 50 ohm interface, and I have limited the bandwidth to 100 megahertz. That's because the frequency here is 100 kilohertz and the pulse width is one microsecond. So we should be able to easily capture that. We're looking at a one microsecond per division here, so we should see the pulses. And I'm gonna go ahead and enable the output, and we get absolutely nothing. So you can see the light comes on, but there's nothing at all on the oscilloscope. Now, of course, this particular oscilloscope and any modern good oscilloscope, we should be able to look at a much, much smaller division to see if, any, if there is any residual of the output actually appearing. We can even look at it in the frequency domain if we want to. Let's go ahead and change that. Let's go to something like, let's say, you know, two millivolts per division. So the output is still off and we don't really see anything. I'm going to enable the output and check it out. We do in fact see some of these tiny pulses. Now this pulse is obviously not one microsecond. It's much, much less than 40 nanoseconds. It looks like 10 nanoseconds. But this tells me that there must be some kind of an AC coupling happening at the output of the instrument. Essentially, whenever there is a rising and a falling edge of the square wave or the pulse, we're getting some output appearing, but then it immediately diminishes. So this would happen if you have some AC blocking cap somewhere that shouldn't be there, and therefore you're only passing the really high frequency content to the output. So that explains that problem. If I go back, you can see that there is a pulse right here and there's a pulse right here. What it should really look like is a up down and here. So when under a falling edge, we get the negative pulse, which is a high pass filter, and the rising edge, we get a positive pulse there. So that's obviously incorrect. So if I go to the output here, right, we're supposed to get this kind of a square wave, which we're obviously not. So that tells us a lot. It also tells us something else that's interesting, is that this instrument somehow disconnects the output. Because if I go over here, like that, and if I turn it on and off, you can see it comes and goes, but I do see tiny little pulses there. And that tells me that there must be something that separates the input from the output, and that could be actually the problem. And we can, do, we can check this by looking at the FFT of this function, of this channel. Even at such a small amplitude, we should be able to see the residual of those pulses. And here's the FFT. Remember that this is at minus 140 dBm is the floor here, and to be expected from a 12-bit converter plus, of course, low-pass filtering it to below such a small value. But look, take a look. These are all square wave pulses. So they're still there, even though we don't see them when the output is disabled, because they're tiny in amplitude. 
should be able to change that even smaller here's one millivolt per division and yeah you do see a little bit of that and here's the pulses now if i enable the output there it is you can see that they're clearly there so that already gave us a huge amount of information it means that the output is essentially always present something disconnects the output and whatever it is that's disconnecting the output has this high pass filter characteristic which of course it shouldn't have so now it's time to take it apart and take a look with what we just learned by looking at the output so here's what's inside of this instrument and well this instrument is made in germany and if you thought the japanese were secretive the germans absolutely no information at all about how this is put together but this is very much the style of the uh, the german team i believe who works on these kind of instruments if you remember a while back i had a bit array test there and it looked like kind of similar style with a lot of boards plugged into each other now at the very top of this is just basically a huge power supply it's not much of an interest because obviously it works and then we have one output board here and you can see there's room for another one which interfaces to the main motherboard through these two connectors and this uh, SMA cable is what goes to the front of the instrument so we can test that separately this cover is probably a combination of heatsink and just um, mechanical stability here so they can put two of these next to each other a few other boards with some heat sinks on top probably some drivers and FPGAs and so on not so important because we kind of know that the problem has to be in this section because everything works we saw the pulses so it has to be somewhere around here that helps a lot actually because it brings us much much closer if the problem was somewhere in here I mean good luck finding what's going on so anyway let's take it one step at a time I'm going to remove this top cover to see what's underneath it at the same time we're going to check to make sure that there's no break from this cable because a tiny break in this cable will actually have the kind of result we saw so let's check that too let's do a quick test on our SMA cable here so I have one of the leads the positive to the front of the instrument and I'm going to measure the center pin here and it's a perfect short circuit essentially so yeah, that's not it that there's no break in that cable and this a DC measurement here is sufficient because you would have to be AC coupled in case the cable was broken and that's not the case and the resistance is extremely low which is what you would expect from a very good connection so that's not the issue and here's what underneath that metal plate here so I do see two almost identical sections with four transistors on each I wonder if this is the the driver and this could be a push-pull H bridge configuration because this is only supposed to create pulses so I wonder if that's what's going on here and a few other components around it and and yeah we're gonna have to do some reverse engineering if you want to understand it but let's work our way backwards from the connector so I'm gonna remove this board completely so we can see also what's on the other side because when I feel underneath it there's a whole bunch of stuff on that side too so we would like to take a look and see what's happening it should be easy to remove and then once we trace out the output we can go one step at a time and start with the very very first thing this is connected to make sure there's nothing obvious there and then we'll do some reverse engineering so let's see what we have here so here's our SMA connector there's actually a little LED in here too which I just noticed and I think this line over here is what's connected to the center pin we'll take a look but then it arrives here into a what it looks like is a six pin component but it's on the other side of the board and if I flip it over like so we can see exactly what's going on and yeah so that center pin right over here goes there and it goes through the board and on the other side and these are relays so I wonder if the problem is in the relay because these are electromechanical of course they're essentially RF relays and if they don't make a good contact they will have a resistive contact there or maybe just a capacitive contact and that could explain the problem now these relays are going to be pretty difficult to find but we can actually easily measure that because if the signal is present we should be able to measure these four pins and find out exactly what is going on with that signal so that should be pretty straightforward I think we should put this back in the instrument because that way this is accessible from the top the bottom we don't really need to take a look at when we're testing that but we can see that really I'll dig out the data sheet for that really too it seems to be a couple of other read switches in there too there's another one here I wonder if that's for maybe the really high voltage output and it kicks in yeah it's a nice board obviously again absolutely no information on it but it does have the power supplies labeled but I don't think that's the issue because we're getting most of its functionality all right so back it goes we'll measure these pins right over here okay let's do some measurements here so I have actually enabled the output and I'm using the fluke here to measure the waveform because it's a lot easier to record it so let's go ahead and take a look at the input of this relay and if I plug over here which is the input into the relay check it out the waveform is actually there so the instrument is generating the waveform and it is applying it to one of the common ports of the relay and if I go to the other side one of the unused pins of the relay this one goes into some connector that I'm not sure why that signal is still there but if I go to our output over here absolutely nothing nothing's coming out of the relay now I can enable and disable the output which is what I'm doing right now and I see absolutely no change so the other interesting thing is that if I put my finger on this relay and if I turn the input on and off I actually don't 
I don't see, I don't feel it switching. And remember, this is an electromechanical relay, so I should be able to feel it click, or I should be able to hear it click, and I see no activity at all. So let's go ahead and measure the pins that are supposed to actually switch the relay and see if they are present. So the other two remaining pins have to be for energizing the relay. Let's try this one. Well, it's outside of the screen, so it must be higher than voltage than that. There it is. So it looks like at 2 volts per division, it's 5 volts. Okay, so that, that is a 5 volt relay. That's one side of his terminal. And that's the other side. Oh, that's also 5 volts. That's interesting. So the voltage across the coil is 5 volts on both sides. There's no voltage across the coil. And if I turn the relay on and off, hmm, I see absolutely nothing. Now if I trace that, that trace over here connects to this component here, which I presume is some kind of a transistor. If I look at that pin, it's also sitting at 5 volt, which makes sense. Okay, that's connected. Now the input of it, ah, I see a resistor here. Let's measure on one side of the resistor. I see, looks like 4 volts. Enable, disable the relay. Ah, look at that. That is beautiful. Okay, so there is a voltage that is correlated with enabling and disabling the output. And that goes across this resistor. Let's measure the other side of the resistor. Okay, it's other side is exactly the same. So there's no current in that resistor. And then it goes into the input of this transistor, which I presume is here. And that also does it. But the output of the transistor is fixed at 5 volts. Okay, that is a huge find. I think that might be at least part of our problem because we are not energizing the relay at all. That's actually pretty good news because if that relay is dead, I don't know where I would be able to find it, although this could still be a problem because the relay may be shorted out or something, the, the coils, and it has damaged that transistor there. But there's no voltage across this resistor, so that is a good sign. So let me zoom in here so you can see what I just discovered a little bit better, so I can also explain it. There we go. So what I measured was the following. So here, here are the two terminals of the relay. So there's 5 volt here, 5 volt here, so nothing, nothing happening across the coil. And then we have this resistor that goes somewhere out, so the signal is coming here. Uh, here I measured the voltage here correlates to the enabling and disabling of the outputs. That looks good. Same here and same here. So this transistor here is responsible for pulling this node down to ground. And this, volt is pro this is probably connected to the power supply, 5 volt. So you pull this down to ground, you pass current through the relay, and the relay switches. But this guy does not do anything. Even though the voltage here changes, the voltage here does not change. So this is our first suspect. Now we should also measure the resistance of this coil to make sure it's not shorted, because if this is shorted, then this device would be shorted, shorting it to ground, essentially, which is not good. But let's measure that just to make sure. But this could be the problem. That would be a fantastic find. Okay, I have turned off the instrument, so it doesn't interfere with measurement of the resistance of the coil. Let's measure across it. And what do we get? 334 ohms. That, I believe, is correct. I did dig out the data sheet of that relay, and I believe this is in part with what we expect. So if the, if the coil does have the correct resistance, and the transistor isn't doing anything, we should identify that transistor first, although we really should know what it is already, because the only reason for you to have this base resistance is that this is a bipolar. Otherwise, you wouldn't need a gate resistance, and there's sometimes they use it for glitching and low-pass filtering, but you don't need that. Let's see, that's a, exactly a 1 kilo ohm resistor. Wow, that's <laughs> really, really precise. So that one kilo ohm resistor that you have there uh, is, is going to basically be the base resistance, so, which means that if there's no voltage across it, there's nothing going through the base. So the base is at least not shorted, but that is a bipolar. Now, we could replace it with a MOSFET. I don't see why not. At the time, probably the, the MOSFETs weren't as good as they are now, but we could also replace it with an equivalent bipolar transistor. There. Let me see if I can find the data sheet for that part. So this is a device that's inside the instrument. As you can see, it's just a general purpose NPN transistor. It has a 200 milliamp DC maximum current going through its collector continuously. VBC is about 40 volts, so you know, generic, nothing unusual. And I look through my parts list and I have this one, which is essentially almost the same thing. It actually has better current carrying capability. It is still a 40 volt device. Of course, it's exactly the same footprint, NPN. So we should be able to just put this instead of what's in there. Okay, so I replaced that. Here it is. This is the one I just took out. And the other NPN that we saw has been installed there. It's a pretty quick exchange. So here's the voltage on one side of the coil. That's 5 volts, which is supposed to be. And on the other side of the coil, we have 5 volts again. I'm going to turn the output on and off. And check it out. It actually does that, which is exactly what you want. And it, therefore, the bipolar is working. And I can also very, very clearly hear the sound. 
and I'll show you. So that is pretty good. So let's go ahead and put it all back together. And in the meanwhile, I'm also going to put some thermal material here before I install the plate because this is really, really hot. But there was no thermal material between those two, so I don't know how good that heatsink was actually working. But nonetheless, I'll add that before I close it up. All right, everything hooked up back again. Let's try it out now, enable on the output. And there it is. It looks beautiful. So it is indeed generating exactly what it's supposed to generate. Now this thing is supposed to be able to put 10 volts into 50 ohm and 20 volts into essentially high impedance. So I just want to verify that as well. I'm not going to put 10 volts into the 50 ohm of this instrument because I think that might be over what it can take. I have to double check. But just to be on the safe side, we can put this into high impedance mode and put the maximum signal it can do and the maximum frequency. I also want to measure the frequency accuracy of this as a last test to make sure everything is okay. So let's set that up. And here I have set the instrument to produce 20 volt peak to peak. This is a one megahertz signal at 500 nanosecond into high impedance. And if I go and enable the output, indeed we do get that 20 volt peak to peak signal, which is one of the strength of this unit. And this is a one megahertz signal, of course. Now, if I want to see the really ultimate performance up to 50 megahertz, I'm going to have to terminate this into a 50 ohm impedance so that I get a nice rise and fall without any ringing. But even here, if I look at the spectrum, all the way to 100 megahertz, you can see clear content there, meaning that these edges are indeed quite sharp. Now I can go ahead and zoom in a little bit more, and you can see that we do have a little bit of ringing. Again, we are terminating this into not a 50 ohm termination, it's into 1 mega ohm, and it is of course going to produce a little bit of ringing, even though that cable is still pretty short over there. So let's take a look at the frequency accuracy now. So I also enabled the internal PLL of this to see what kind of frequency accuracy we can get out of it. And against the rubidium standard, you know, it's not terribly off, considering that it hasn't been calibrated for many, many years. And this instrument actually has a cycle-to-cycle -cycle accuracy of 0.01%, so it's really quite good. So even if the exact frequency isn't there, the cycle-to-cycle -cycle accuracy is certainly something that is quite powerful with these units, and one of the reasons why they can be used for, for precise timing if you need to measure, for example, delays between two pulses and so on. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this quick repair. We were reasonably lucky that it didn't have a major problem. Of course, as you saw, we can deduce where the problem can actually be by looking at just the output, even when there is nothing connected and it does not even working. There's a lot you can extract from that. And as always, thanks to my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to support the channel, there's a link in the description. It really does help, of course, keep the channel sustained, especially with these repairs. If you have any questions, let me know in the comment section. I'll see you there.